All right, welcome everybody to this social transformation lunch. This is our second social transformation lunch, which is led by the social transformation faculty here at United and the Leadership Center for Social Justice. And we're really happy that you are, are all here to join us um, for this uh, special lunch on disability justice. Um, my name is Rai Sibuko. I am the director of the Leadership Center for Social Justice, and I'm really excited to have a special, uh, two special guests with us today. The Reverend Laura Kanata, a graduate of United, United, United. and Greg Woods, a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Um, Greg and I went to school together. They will be giving uh, a presentation on disability liberation theology and disability justice. Both Laura and Greg are passionate about these subjects and, and they are involved in this work in the Twin Cities and beyond. Laura serves on the UCC Disability Ministries Board of Directors and is a minister at Robbinsdale Parkway UCC. <laughs> Represent. <laughs> And Greg serves on the steering committee of the Institute for Theology and Disabilities and the preaching team at New City Church. Uh, Greg and Laura, thanks so much for joining us today. And I will hand over to you. I look forward to hearing the presentation. Well, we were going to start with a poem that I wrote. And it's just kind of an introduction about why we need disability justice. I just brought a copy in case it's hard to understand or something. Um, it's entitled Eugenics, Eugenics, and Genocide. Eugenics is alive and well. Society makes being disabled a living hell. I wish I could write a cute little rhyme or easy and monic, but this subject is too important for frivolity. So here's the facts. Sometimes we are an eyesore. How dare we leave the house? People don't want to see our disfigurements and deformities. And they don't mind saying so either. And what's the point of leaving home when most buildings are close to us? And if by some act of kindness we do get in, the rust of the building is unnavigable. Disabled people lose their health insurance and monthly government payments if we get married. This is a roundabout way to ensure that we don't procreate. It's forced sterilization without the inconvenience of paying a doctor. Sometimes we are seen as useless burdens, and yet not only is there no incentive for productivity, it is in fact actively discouraged with financial penalties. We are not allowed to own a home or any assets, constantly enforcing dependency and financial ruin. We can't afford to rent, we must choose between a group home or homelessness forced incarceration, or death from independence. Either way, it is a slow genocide. It is a rare opportunity to find employment. Bottom line, why should they pay us and pay for our accommodations? It's not cost-effective, and in the capitalist society, money means more than people. We are routinely denied life-saving treatment, all the more so if you are a person of color, even more during the pandemic. This cost of treatment and resources are not worth it for the quality of life you deem us to have. But if we don't get to determine your quality, why should you get to determine ours? As a disabled person, we have the choice of one of two roles, either anger and bitterness, being the troublemaker, the rebel rouser, always asking for change, or we can be the innocent object of pity, the act of charity able people do to feel better about themselves. And if we're not properly grateful for basic rights, i.e. accommodations to be able to pee, et cetera, then we have obviously chosen option number one. There is no in between, just a flip side of the same coin. <laughs> Being disabled doesn't hinder me. Society has placed the stumbling blocks. So thanks for asking, but no, I don't hate my body. But why should I care for a nation that both actively and passively wants me dead? Being disabled, not a disaster. Being a member of society, come back and we give a chance. 
And I wrote that during the pandemic, so that would be great. Mm -hmm. Flex mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. kind of true. Mm -hmm. So that's so that. Mm -hmm. Hey, you want to start the yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Love for that powerful poem. Um uh uh something I really connect to it, your poem that I just gave a zoning uh to my church about talking about purity culture and the body uh, about how um disabled people um until recently even in popular media you couldn't be there wasn't a desired disabled people will never display that romantic argument will not ever romantically involved they will they could be your bin that uh every, some of you remember life goes on the cookie. Uh, 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 he was a Ben, but no one ever went on a date with him. Um, so something I was talking about in the Zoom end was about uh, there is a research of poverty of people talking about purity culture and liberal in the liberal church because under the guise of sexual ethics um but um but when I ever I challenge them so what happens if in the US disabled people lose their benefit if they get married. And Bunny, they never respond to that question. So I said that um, they are they are not willing. Um, people who have the ethics are not willing to think about that. The ramification of misguided theology, even under the guise of ethics. Um, but I think we can get into a larger debate about the myths, no more sexual ethics, and just co ha um, co-lating sexual ethics with sex. No such people. Marriage is not having a ethical debate, but having a just trying to trust a poor culture and to liberal uh, normal culture. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I will do the book slide and then, yeah, so uh, we are talking today about Disability. Well, we were talking about disability theology and disability justice. So, folks, <coughs> um, nicely, easily came up. Well, kind of the full portion of disability liberation theology with her book, uh, the disabled God, where we. Uh, we'll show you later. But actually, in it, she, she never actually defines, she never actually makes a clear definition of what she means by that theology. Um, so uh, uh, I found this definition from an article in 2005. For disability studies quarterly. Um, so I, I really love the definition. A spiritual discourse that unites a critical acknowledge of the economic dimensions, uh, disability, 
of Plato and a, a appreciation for the living experience of disabled person. And Scott Bagel is actually a theologian. We were writing this article from a disability studies perspective, and he is a professor at education. Uh, I've done a lot in disability studies, but I still think it is a really good definition. So, um, and it uh, that comes out of the general liberation reality uh, that first appeared um, at the the Vatican. Um, and uh, like the American theological center in poor people experiences, um, and uh, and like the America um study in the late nineteen cities, uh, like booty areas, could start booty areas for uh ideology and liberation and. Uh, 1969, 1970. So, um, and um, Arjo, um, I want to, we want to uh say that there a lot of debate about folks and folks language or identity folks language. So, folks who were a disability or a disabled person, there's a big debate that will take. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, we are using identity, folks, language, disability, people, disabled people. So, so I wanted to let you know. Yeah, what did you do? Yeah, so. We put down a bunch of different key concepts of disability. And I'm going to have someone hit a button on that. Oh, yeah, no. disability justice. <laughs> there we go. Now I can see. Okay. Key concepts of disability justice. Um, and we listed some of them here and some on another page. And I was going to talk about a couple of them, and then when you guys ask questions about which one sounded more interesting to you. But we've got accessibility, we've got interdependent, we've got representation, we have equity versus equality, healing versus curing, social model versus the medical model, versus a charity model, versus a rights-based model, and different things like that. And, we're, and the one that I was going to talk about was just to get it, um, accessibility is a big thing. You talk, you know, Access Sundays, we have in UCC, and, you know, people talk about accessibility, but accessibility, you know, means a lot of things because it's not just about the physical access. That's the, the key part, but it's more than that. It's emotional access. It's social access. It's spiritual access. So accessibility means not only can I, physically get into the space, but I belong to me, this one is me. I belong within that space. Churches, for example. Having access to the church is part of my rights as a spiritual being. If I'm barred from a, any way from a house of worship, society is impeding on my right to spirituality, to have my experience with my peers. Now there's the physical barriers that I can't at, enter. There's no ramps or elevators and things like that. But even if there's no staircase, but there are people still staring at me when I come into the building, or like it doesn't happen at church, but like happens in the street, people taking like they got their phones out, and just take these pictures, and then you're like, what's that? No, me. It's like I just like. But you know, that is still a lack of access. So accessibility is about this physical space and the attitudes around me. And I talk about um Luke 5, 17 to 26, when they lowered the man down on the mat through the roof. That's the sermon I preached this past Sunday. Um, 
Sunday. And that's all about accessibility and whose responsibility is it? Is it, you know, was it the house owner's responsibility? Was it the disabled person's responsibility? And different things like that. But that's kind of the theological angle. So um, the other one is um, interdependence. And I put down something about the Trinity, and then you put down the Trinity. So um, mm -hmm. I think the Trinity is all about interdependence because it's not God sitting up in the sky, God's self. It's God, parent, child, spirit. You know, it's, it's three in one. That's the definition of interdependence. That's how God chooses to represent God's self is in relationship with others. And I also think independence, especially totally, like 100% pull yourself up by your boots yourself made is a myth. And it's a myth that we kind of idol worship, especially here in the USA. But nobody, nobody does that. I mean, as a baby, you rely on your parents. When they get older, they rely on you. Even if you're a single person with just like a cat or a dog, you're still in a relationship with the animal with food and shelter, you require it for love and affection. And I think um, independence at all costs is definitely an American idol and idolatry. And I think disabled people teach the gospel of interdependence just by existing. Um, I think we have a lot more stuff, like we didn't know how to just wrote stuff down. But um, did you want to say anything more about interdependence? Yeah. Two weeks ago, I preached about the disabled God on the World Communion Day. And I was thinking about how in the communion, where we um, take part as a community, it is that we need each other. Um, and we are all part of the body that it, we are making a covenant to not only with God, but with each other when we do take communion. Um, the other thing is, I also, we also wrote down, uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, yeah. You that? Cool. Um, Common humanity or regular needs, like going to the bathroom, <laughs> eating food, you know. We also talk about creativity, respect, listening, and intersectionality. Those are the things that we've thought about are different concepts. Are there any of those? Is there a particular one that anybody wants to hear more about? You want to keep coming back? Creativity. Creativity. All right. So, I know, I know it's a little fun, so I'm going to read it. Um, <laughs> disabled people have to be creative. Adapt or die. <laughs> no, but seriously, fill in the blank. Housing, renovations, life hacks. Um, my theory is all those info, and I think I read this somewhere. I don't think I just made it up. But all those infomercial items, the one that you're like, why do you need a one-handed banana peel? Well, because somebody out there has one hand. But if you market it towards the disability community, the insurance is going to have to pay for because it's going to be three thousand dollars. But if you market it towards mainstream people, then it can be twenty five or fifty bucks. So um, clothes, adding um, safety pins to dresses and little zipper pulls to zippers, and um, carrying a step stool with me everywhere. I don't leave the house without a bag because I have to have this bathroom aid and this food aid and this whatever. And it's it's all about being creative and adapting to the situation. And it's, it's a life skill that there's this thing called crip wisdom and it's skills that disabled people know that other people like with the pandemic. It was very, very hard on me. I mean, it was very, very hard. It was very, very hard on me anxiety wise because i have anxiety and it just like was like aha now you were right all along you all are good enough but 
At the same time, I adapted faster and quicker than my non part counterparts because I was like, oh, well, this is the new norm. And I've been doing a different new norm before that. Before that, it was a different new norm. And the, the loss factor of like, well, I can't do this thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you can do this thing instead. It's like, no, no, no. Let's do and yeah. Um, do you want to say anything about creativity? Yeah. Um... The able-bodied society are like, hey, how can we deal with you? So we have to find our own ways to break down the barriers, uh, it's just like, um, uh, uh, how do, um, how do the, we, Society is made for able-bodied folks, and so we do survive. We have to be creative, like you said. Um, so it's said that um, I was uh, talking to you. I was uh, visiting with, uh, uh, with one of our friends and our disability community, and. See blind and see we were talking about we about how she had to that learn how she could adapt her classes to so that she could study and um because uh the uh, undergrad and grad institutions where she went never dealt with a blind person uh, at the decades. So they didn't know how to adapt. So she had to do a that for them. Um, so that the burden is on us. So. Any other questions either about any of these topics or just something you always wanted to ask? Could you go back to the slide previously? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um give me a no, 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 no. Um I think there's a way to go back. I'm really curious about the last comment, the social versus medical versus charity. Okay, I can do medical social if you want to do the charity versus right. Yeah, yeah. Because you know that one better. Yeah. So medical model is pretty self-explanatory. It's, you know, it's medicine, it's the diagnosis, it's, it's you have an impairment, you have this and that, you're, you're disabled, disabled and impairment. Are interchangeable in the medical model, and um, you know, ultimately the problem is me. Or the problem is break. The problem is ours to fix. Nobody else has to take responsibility for it, and we are deviant from the society and stuff. The social model says goes back to the animals. I am not disabled. Not this. Like I have arthritis, but. My house is set up for me. When I leave the house, society disables me by not having curb cuts, by not having, you know, rail everywhere. And so the problem lies with society's response to me. That's what the social model says. And it says we need to take social responsibility and like universal design doesn't just help disabled people, it helps everyone. That's why it's called universal design. But people don't. Yeah. So that's the that's the social versus the medical model, and then uh, the charity model and like uh, a good disaster. Well, a little dated now that it isn't funny, but like Jewy kids, uh, the Labor Day, but MDA Teledon, and, and like <laughs> oh poor people. 
All the poor kids still need money so that we gotta help them and they need our help. Um so let me hear. So um so inspiration and porn, um basically and the right space model is uh looking at um uh how um like, uh like our assets is like our ability to access society is a human right. Um and uh I will put in here um how many of you deserves lower uh knew that the ADA six judges yeah, so uh, many of our institutions, well, like churches, mark, like religious institutions, so and many and many um congregations, uh, disabled people not only can get in the door, but even if they can, can they get to the pulpit? Uh, <laughs> Can they get to um, the places they need to lead the churches, not even just to get in? So, um, yeah. I heard you say it was somewhere once that um, like building a ramp isn't for you. It's for everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. And that there's some like 80% of all of us will have to use a ramp at some point in our life. Yeah. Taps. Temporarily able bodied. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We are temporarily able bodied. Until we're not. Yeah. So all the churches that have ramps, they're they're little plaques, like named after the one person. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But but everybody uses it because everybody's yes. benefits from exactly the, 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 a more accessible space. Yeah. Like we all use the ramp here. Yeah. yeah. Almost no one uses those stairs. Yeah. Unless you have a class in that room. Yeah. <laughs> and you're temporarily able to buy Anything else? I'm interested to hear more about the human versus human. Okay. So, again, I read in Healing Homiletic by Kathy Black. I think it's an older book, but it's a good book. Um, about healing versus curing. And the way I kind of look at it is healing and curing are often used interchangeably, and that's kind of dangerous thinking. So, like, I think about, like, faith healing, like, on the one hand, praying for an outcome is good. I totally believe in that. But I also, there's healing versus curing. So if you pray for me to wake up tomorrow morning and be five foot tall, that is a cure. That is a miraculous cessation of the disease or condition. And when it's something like a cold or cancer, yeah, that'd be awesome. But like when you say it's like five feet to grow, that's a little weirder. And it's, it's all. But then you have healing, which is where I accept the fact that I can't reach the top shelf of things. And, I, and society accepts the fact that I can't reach the top shelf of things. And I integrate my life. My it's, it's about being whole. It's a wholeness without saying you have to be perfect to be. You have to be the norm to be whole. It's like, okay, this is, this is me. This is my life. Here's the adaptation. Take. Here's the adaptations you need to, make, need to make on my behalf. Together, we're going to get along and I get to be part of society. That's healing. When Jesus did stuff in the Bible, he kind of did them both at the same time, which I think is why a lot of people are so confused and stuff. So he said to the guy, get up and walk. But what he also did was bring that guy back into society, which at the time, the nuance between healing and curing and all of it wasn't that anyway. 
because he could have just said, you know, well, let's make a, a rap, and they would have been like, no, let's what's a rap? And things like that. So he did in the stories the way you know the story the way the story is written kind of thing. So that's kind of my you know thing about hearing versus healing. I think that people are so focused on hearing that it damages healing. And that's um if this person I think is has epilepsy, was an epileptic, and they wrote about um how to preach the healing gospels from a disabled person's perspective instead of all the like, well, if you just have enough faith, then you'll be free of XYZ perspectives. So so I like that book. A follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, I um I'd be shocked if you haven't also heard this, but I've heard many times the oh don't worry because in heaven you won't be disabled anymore. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Um but uh I was wondering, I've never had a good rebuttal to that my whole life. I was wondering if you had like uh thoughts on the theology of like the resurrected body and like disability in heaven yeah i think it depends on your definition of heaven like i really do because when i think about heaven i see myself without the arthritis i see myself without the pain i see myself happy and enjoying my existence but i don't see myself like i said any taller <laughs> also in heaven i can fly so I mean, <laughs> you know, that's what happens actually. Like, I don't know, but that's kind of my that's how I imagine heaven. I don't so people imagine heaven differently, but the concept of imagining that you're not going to use a wheelchair in heaven comes from that's like the scariest thing to people who don't use wheelchairs. That's the scariest thing is to so it's really it says more about the person making the statement than it does about like me or my theology it's more about well why do you think do you and does god not love me the way that i am oh no 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 no. god loves you but then why would god change me when i get to heaven yeah. you know it's like it's getting them to like critical thinking skills which not everybody has <laughs> but it's trying to like engage those muscles that's what i would do or if i were completely honest i'd probably say something sarcastic <laughs> which doesn't help so i'm giving you the help for it. <laughs> yeah i think for me the resurrected body of christ came back bearing the wounds of the crucifixion and i think that why i don't like the doubting Thomas narrative because I think the uh, doubting Thomas narrative really misses the key point. Not about uh about believing but what I seeing, but that Christ came back with a perfect disabled party. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. I I think in that, I think Thomas wanted to see that body and to see did he actually come back bearing the wounds or did he come back not bearing the wounds? And more like it was more of a question of not. Nah, disbelief but um uh, inquiry and I think it we and the disabled God liberates everyone from because we are all made perfect in our own imperfect bodies in the image of God.
Talk more. Yeah, I don't know how much time we have, so I don't have to run over. But I've got. Okay. okay. The next slide had had listening on it. Yeah. And it, it, one of the big things that you taught me, Laura, was that it was listening to the people who don't or can't communicate for themselves mm -hmm. in the way that you need them to communicate. And anticipating and trying things out and being creative and, and and because there are disabled people who don't have that ability to mm -hmm. communicate. Um and uh and going beyond what you think is welcome mm -hmm. and, and to check that out with family members with whatever and and mm -hmm. um I just think that's an important thing. It's not just, you know, awesome. This 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 person that you know presents with a disability can say, fix this. Yeah. What about yeah. the person that can't? You know. Exactly. I, I operate on the field of dreams model. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. And um, you really do you have to listen. Some people, you know know their disability, know their needs, and people don't know them or can't communicate them in the way that you communicate. So you have to find out. Everybody is trying to communicate, but there's a normal way of communicating that a lot of people don't listen to any other way of communicating because they're like, well, that's not communication. That's a temper tantrum. That's a attention-seeking behavior. It's like, no, they're trying to tell you something. It just depends on if you listen or not. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about listening? Yeah, having a disability, a speech impediment. Um, that uh, people have. I have a different way, a different cadence than people who speak normally. Um, and I am, I am from Missouri, and the state animal in the world. Um, and I've been described as stubborn as a rule. Um, and I knew I always had a voice that I wanted other people to listen to. Um, and going to seminaries, I had I found my voice in preaching, but um, um, the folks you you are at Princeton, you take a speech, um, everyone. Um, I teach them much those, and um, I, I never understood that, but speech is created, um, and uh, it like not pass fair like preaching is. I um, so at the end of my first semester, the preaching professor came up to me. I was like, "What should I give you?" Um, I, I was like, well, I did all of the assignments. I was here of a class. And hey, I was like, well, if your speech doesn't improve, I will have to fail you. Um, and then uh, later on, he said, well, a, a good thing you are a Quaker. Because you won't have to preach, and um, I left class of all. Um, and the seminary uh, allowed me to switch 
classes and um, so I had another professor, but the professor was never made to apologize, was never penalized, um, um, and I think he has retired, but thankfully, um, I think he was actually such as, um, and the law to the uh, female bodies and what they were. Um, so, um, but it just like, but when I got into, when I get into the pulpit and speak my truth, I always remember that People I tried to tell me to be quiet. I always tried to submit my votes. I, I think i I think that is how we are writing to is letting is I be created and that never shutting up, never always fighting for our rights. Laura, I wonder if you could talk more about this poem. Um, and I think, in particular, I guess I'm thinking about um, sort of what it means to be disabled in under capitalism. Um, and, how, you know, I mean, there's a sense in which, like, capitalism kind of there's a uselessness, right, to yeah. people that can't produce, can't somehow, and and, and this uselessness that all then they become a problem. Yeah, right? it's the Protestant work ethic, which you know, work is fine and good, but to link work with work, which is what capitalism does, it's not just you're not working. It's you're not working and that makes you bad. And it's not just like, and then we, we, we can label it like, like, okay, for me, for example, I, I do ministry, I want to work, but I'm using it, it's fine. But if I didn't want to work, that would be understandable because, well, so she's disabled and all that good stuff, so it's okay she doesn't work. But then like, if Stella didn't work, you know, we're going to judge Stella. We're not going to judge Laura from but we are going to judge Stella. Because from all appearances, Stella looks able-bodied and healthy. So is she just lazy? Like, why isn't Stella working? And Stella is working. I just, I just got her. You know, why isn't Stella working? Because what, what is their reasoning? Oh, well. And, and then if they have a reason, I don't have a car. Well, then you better get a bus pass. Or I'm depressed. Well, then you better get on medication. There's... There's no, and again, we need people to work to make the world go round. I get that. You know, you have to have doctors and lawyers and people to work at the grocery store. But with capitalism, it's become too much. And also, people work, like, I'm all for, like, the basic income things. I think it's called universal basic income. And stuff like that. But people work so they can survive. And if you're not working, you're not going to survive. And if you are surviving, has to be in the bare minimum. Like all these little nuanced rules that I put into this poem are real. So I'm on supplemental security income, which says I can get twenty dollars in gifts a month. So if it's my birthday, I can get a twenty dollar gift card to Target or something, and that's it. Actually, I don't. I hope gift cards don't count because. <laughs> but um, what I'm saying is there's there's all these rules and you have to fill out forms and you you're policed your existence is policed and when your existence is policed and all the more so if you're like disabled and a person of color I'm assuming I don't know but if your existence is policed that causes a little I mean like there's a correlation between disability and mental health I don't know the exact correlation I've tried to find it like like scientific studies and I have had trouble because I don't have like access to psychology journals. But there has got to be because when the whole world closes in on you, it's hard to breathe. And so I like my friends. 
I like this community. I do not like the United States of America, and I don't know if I'd like other countries either. I don't know, because the country as a whole does not want me. They don't care for me. When the pandemic happened, it was very clear, and I didn't read the other poem that I brought. I don't know where I put it, because I have another poem somewhere. Thank you. Um, the truth you will not see, and that's even more about the text that um, I brought that I don't even know that's why. But you can make copies if you want to look at that one. But long story short, the concept of society, like I don't want to say nobody cares about where we're dying, because it's not true. Plenty of people care about where we're dying. Nobody in power does. Nobody in power gives a damn. Otherwise, things would change. Uh, and things don't change. Um, I think it was Martin. I think it was Martin Luther King. You know, rights. You have to demand rights. They don't happen just to you as nicely. And the thing with being disabled is, I spend two thirds of my week at, at a doctor for something, or calling the insurance to make sure they pay for the doctor, or calling the pharmacy and things that. I don't have any energy left to fight for my rights, and that's. In this section here, and I have to preface this with, I like doing what I'm doing. I picked this job for a reason. So when I talk about teaching, I don't mean like this kind of teaching. I mean like when I'm out on the street and people start asking me any questions. But why must my life be a case study? For once, I just simply want to exist. But in order for me to exist, we must care. In order for you to care, and must teach. If I spend every moment teaching, when do I get to? <clears throat> Did I? I don't yeah. know if that answers yeah. you. No, I was just struck by that when we talked about the social model, just the the way that um, we use language of that the social order disables you. It's not that you're disabled, but yeah. the, the kind of the way that it's sort of it's, it tends to be flipped, right? Mm -hmm. The disabled person is the problem, mm -hmm. as opposed to the social order is the problem, mm -hmm. and how a society that um that is structured around uh productivity and work and these kinds of things like tends to kind of i don't know kind of create those mythologies in order to sustain itself mm -hmm. to i was just struck by all the different it's like i want to read this it's like you go this way you go that way there's nothing you can do and you get the way you describe it is like you know can't breathe the stuff how do you there's almost no way out of it. Well, I think interdependence is the way out if you have to put it into it. Because like anything that's just, that's created. I read something someone was talking about racism. And what they said was like racism is like eggs baked into the cake of the US. I can't remember the exact reference. And then someone's like, well, you can't taste racism. You can't taste eggs in the cake or something. Like, whatever. And it's like, no, but somebody who's allergic to eggs will know those eggs, even if you can't taste the egg in the cake. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing about racism. And I, I would think that could also apply to ableism. I mean, it's, nobody needs to, like, the pull it up by your bootsteps. Like, nobody's ever told me to pull myself up by my bootsteps. But it's in the back of your brain. And you would tell, you might tell somebody else to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And if you say that enough times in your head, it applies to everyone, whether or not you actually verbally express it. It's the, it's the implicit bias. Um, so we have about seven minutes. So uh, maybe we should talk about uh, weed churches. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, the books and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. So, um, I think the books book, uh, the books cover are under the computer. So, yeah. um, so what do you talk yeah. about that book? This is a really good book, Disfigured on Fairy Tales, Disability and Naked Space by Amanda Ledoux. And it, it talks a lot about fairy tales. It's a bit of a literature bank, but it talks about <laughs> stories we tell are the realities we make. An example is if the villain is always a star or a limp, 
in Disney films or any child's movie. And now you got your five year old son and you're out at the park and there's an old man with a limp. What does the kid do? What What is that reality that we've now created for our five year old child? And, and it's, it's a really good book. So that's disfigured. And then you want to talk about this? Yeah, one? yeah. Uh, the Shape of God. Um, it is a red book cover with white leather that said the bit shape of God and then the then there an image of a mural that I don't know how to describe what that colored. Uh but there is the book I was mentioning before it was but there in nineteen ninety four based on actually easily Dissertation. Um, she taught at Emory. I got a PhD at Emory at the and Society, and they kind of started the movement. Um, it is a little bit, but it is still a good book. Um, uh, just. Great book. I made the mistake of making it my first is the only book I'm reading at the church though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you do this one too, because I haven't read this one yet. I own it, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Me either. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did this uh this the ability at the way of Jesus written by Bethany McKinney Box, who is a PhD from Florida. Seminary I used to pastor in the OA area. Um, but uh, she talks about the healing narratives, uh, and but also reads in stories um, of people seeing those. Um, Still, the visibility is a bunch of stories that have been curated by Nancy Wong. Or I did Alice Wong, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, first person stories from the 21st century, and it's all from disabled people's perspective. You've got Harry McBride Johnson's account of her debate with Peter Singer, who was, um, he was really, really good for animal rights, but he also said disabled people should be killed at birth and things like that. Um, you've got some stories from an author named Kia Brown, um, have a grandma, all sorts of things. It's really good. It's a good combination. And then I talked briefly about the healing homiletic, which is um, by Kathy Black, and it takes a lot of the different healing stories, gives a traditional homily, and then gives a dis disability perspective homily. Cool. And uh, I would talk about loving our bones in a minute, but since Invalid is a good website, do you want to talk about yeah, it? Sins Invalid is a person of color, queer collective, I think would be the right word. Yeah. And they coined the words disability justice. And they coined the concept of disability justice. And it's all, they have their 10 um principles of disability justice and it's talks about intersectionality is like the top one because nobody is just disabled and nobody is just gay nobody's just black nobody's very so when you talk a lot of the disability rights movement was very white person focused and the disability justice movement is trying to it started with queer and black people so it's trying to be more inclusive. And there were two books we didn't bring you, but I will. I um, yeah, I had them too. I, I forgot to bring them. So, um, the votes in my body is not a prayer request. Um, uh, disability judge it in the church by intending. Mm -hmm. Do you I read that one. Yeah, that's a good one. And we did that as a book club at my church. And that that's a good one. And it goes through different chapters 
about disability justice, different Bible verses, different experiences this particular woman had in her life? Um, yeah, and then uh, another one that just came out um, is where well, did that go? Yeah, I just um, uh, it that uh, came out last month. Loving our bones by Julia Watts Butler is a professor at Georgetown, uh, and uh, she has written other books, but this is her uh, most recent book. Uh, um and uh Julia Rockpetzler is a wheelchair user and speaker and speaker and institute uh, on the allergy and disability and the dimension rights from a Jewish perspective. So uh unlike other 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 theology books uh that uh, from a non Christian perspective. So I wanted to include that to make sure that um uh it, it's starting to be written about uh, other cultures too. Um so I wanted to bring that up as a example. There is also a biblical commentary called Disability in the Bible, and it's the only Bible commentary that references disability that I can find. It's not, you know, I wanted it to be like, you know, chapter by chapter, it's or like verse by verse, but it's more like book by book. So it's like, oh, Job, but not like every, you no, know, it's still good, it's still good, but someday someone will like. Thanks so much for sharing your wisdom, insights, and uh, you've, you've given us a lot to, to think about and these resources to explore further um, these issues of disability justice and disability liberation theology. So really appreciate you taking the time to share all this with us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for inviting us.